if I have more pain, if I die later today or tomorrow, <laughs> it's a win. Stay present with that. Do what you need to feel alive. So there's a soul, a dear, blessed, loving soul named Ethan Sisser. He's 36. He was diagnosed with glioblastoma. He started documenting his journey on Facebook, TikTok, YouTube. Doctors said there's nothing they can do. The chemo can't help. Not doing the chemo, nothing would change either. What's going to happen next is I'm going to keep a smile in my heart. One thing I would love is a strong support system. I feel like it could be beautiful for everyone involved. I don't know if anybody's ever done it in terms of how you're doing it. We all are born, we all leave the body, so why not do it in the most beautiful way possible? I'm trying to medically find a way to where he can be comfortable in a home setting. I am embodied. I am empowered. I am ecstatic. Mind if I get this off my chest now. It's a journey with him. And I can only go so far. My sense of Ethan's state of being fills this whole area. He called for a family, and this family showed up. death be fun? I mean, that could be the most exciting journey ever. Just before we start, Aditi, just to let you, everyone know that there are screenings. There's the screening on Thursday evening, and Julianne will share the link with you either in the chat or on email. And then there's a, uh, there's a panel discussion following that. And then on uh, Sunday, there's another screening with Compassionate Communities Australia. And again, Julianne will send you the link on that. And while I'm talking, I would like to also encourage everybody not only to attend a film screening twice if you can, it's such an important film, but please look at Aditi's TEDx talk. I've been asked to do a TED talk, Aditi, and I don't need to now because you've said everything I ever want to say. So um, that's that's a relief. Um, so, Aditi, a warm, warm, warm welcome to uh, to us here in Australia, and thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you. So we're we're talking really about com compassionate communities in Australia, and I'm just so interested in what you're achieving in in this in the states um but before we get into the the conscious you know living and dying can you can you just talk a little bit more about the film while we have you um as we have the screenings uh the uh this week yeah thank you joe and i still encourage you to do a tedx i think your valuable <laughs> experiences will flavor the the talking and the sharing it's quite a journey to the TEDx stage. <laughs> wow. So my experience with that young man you saw really changed my life uh, on many levels. And this was a young man. He was 36, as you may have gathered from the trailer. And he was diagnosed with a glioblastoma in 2019, right before COVID hit. So much of his cancer journey was in Brooklyn, New York, um, during the pandemic. And so he started documenting his journey on social media, as you saw. And at that time, it was, you know, his integrative therapies and his, his philosophy of life. And, and ultimately, as he was nearing death, it became about his journey towards his last breath. And a friend of mine had been watching his live streams. And I only came to know of Ethan about two weeks before he ultimately took his last breath and died. Um, 
he, my friend Jojo basically heard Ethan on one of his uh, streams say, I am dying. At this point, he was in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is a different state near his father. And he was in an inpatient hospice facility, which is a wonderful offering if you have if you have one in your area. Not many communities have a freestanding hospice. So he was lucky to have a safe, comfortable place to be. And still he put out in the universe, he said, I am dying and I want to die in community, which didn't seem feasible at the time. None of his friends live nearby. And I would like to film my dying process to support people to perhaps have less fear around death and dying. And so Jojo, my friend, heard the call and he called me as a community organizer and a hospice doc in town. And he called my friend, um, our friend, Scott Kirschenbaum, director of films. Not only documentaries, but intimate, vulnerable documentaries where he's filmed a bir the birthing process. He's filmed a woman with dementia from the perspective of the woman in a nursing home. So very um, uh, intimate experiences that I think few people could probably capture so mm. artfully as Scott did. So I got the call and I um, met with him on a Wednesday on Zoom just to get a sense of what his understanding is was about his condition, what his hopes were and desires were for his transition, just like you would at a goals of care conversation if you're in healthcare. So I did that on Zoom and he was very clear. I wanna come to this community, do what it takes to make this happen. So the next day I talked to the nurse practitioner. She said, absolutely not. He is not safe to travel. I think he could die en route. He could leave against medical advice mm -hmm. if, uh, if you want, if he wants. And, and so that was a little hurdle, but ultimately with conversations, he came to us and to the inpatient facility I worked in. It was 26 beds, freestanding. And, and after multiple conversations with risk management, legal, marketing, Everything was looking good that they would allow us to film in the facility, but ultimately they said, no, you cannot film because it's too risky. Something negative about hospice might be revealed, which I okay. thought was an interesting. Okay. Yeah. And at that moment, I realized, you know, I had been in hospice since I was 17 as a volunteer first and then a hospice doctor and death doula later. And not much had changed in, in terms of our cultural approach to death. And the medical system, which we have tasked to do this, you know, wasn't doing it in my community. And, and, and so it became really clear that it's not really up to the medical establishment to help shift this culture. They have a part to play, advanced directives, good, you know, goals of care conversations, palliative care, hospice, absolutely. But then there's a bigger conversation that is, is happening with compassionate communities, for example. But at that moment, I, I, it was clear that we couldn't film. And I asked Ethan, I said, Ethan, we could try to find you a place to go um, and rally a community to support you, or you can stay here and, you know, we can do what we can um, to film bits and pieces. And he said, I would do whatever it takes to make this happen again. So we found him a home and I called upon our Asheville community to serve him as he was dying. And he was able to be in a beautiful setting overlooking the mountains, surrounded by strangers who became friends and family. And his parents were able to come as able. Um, they physically weren't able to care for him. And hospice came into the home, and we did ritual, ceremony, everything that was meaningful to him in his living days, he was able to have surrounding him until his last breath. So that's the story. of the. So I was going to do it whether the film crew came or not. I would have done it. And mm. um, the film crew did ultimately come. So, so that, that's that was a long, long answer. <laughs> no, no, not at all. It's... Uh... It's incredible how the community came together and it is the essence of a compassionate community, isn't it? To take in some sort of religious connotations almost, you know, to take in the stranger, um, you, you know, to care for without judgment, without agenda. Um, that That's how it comes across in the film, this very heartfelt, warm uh, community. The... And I'm sure that's how it must have felt, Aditi. Yeah, so, you know, we had never done this before um, in this formation. So there was, you know, death can be messy, as many of you probably know. There's some drama and a lot of ego and personality, not negative, mm -hmm. but just a lot of opinions. And so we navigated that with ease and grace, but it definitely wasn't without some challenges. But overall, it was an incredibly inspiring, easeful process. And 
what people kept coming up to me saying while during the journey, I call it two week journey mm. with Ethan was, can we do this? Can we buy a house? Can we take care of one another? It's time. You know, there was just such a, uh, such a jazzed energy about the whole experience. Lines of people wanting to deliver food and offer massage and acupuncture and aromatherapy and all the things one could wish for was that they were just freely giving. And it was a pivotal time in your career by the sounds of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had, um, the people I called upon were a group that we had gathered, we'd gathered about monthly for a couple of years back in 2014. So this was 2021. So this group um, had been having conversations, meeting monthly, just dreaming into a future of elder care and death and dying care. Mm -hmm. um, and so I called upon them and, and it was really, um, the timing of it was such, I think after being during the pandemic, having seen so many isolated deaths, Mm -hmm. um, combined, com so the contrast for the, of this death to those that I'd witnessed was start, you know, um, stark and, mm -hmm. and it was just really clear to me, there's more for me to do. So I put my notice in actually shortly after he took his last breath and mm -hmm. I surrendered to whatever, I just followed the breadcrumbs and that led to the center for conscious living and dying and, and this conversation even. So, mm, yeah, quite, quite extraordinary. And just for people who might, might be late joining us, uh, um, we're talking with Aditi Satya, who's uh, the founder of Conscious um, Living and Dying. Have I got that right, Aditi? Yeah, the, the Center for Conscious Living. The Center, that's it. I knew there's another scene there. Uh, yeah, I knew there's <laughs> another scene there. The Center. So please look it up on the internet. Um, it's very, very interesting and very much aligned with compassionate communities. Um, and we're also open to take questions. If people have questions, um, send them to you, Julianne. Would that be right? And Because um, I'm sure that there's lots of interest in what you have to say. One of the things that Ethan said, a question someone asked him, which is something I've thought about for a long time as well, is, you know, is dying a, a solitary occurrence or is it a community occurrence? And I just wondered if what, what your thoughts on, on that are, Aditi. You, know, you must have seen a lot of people die and different aspects of that come to light in different families and what, what, what your sense of that is. Yeah, thank you. You know, I often have thought that life and death is really a solo journey on, on some mm -hmm. fundamental level. Yes, we have community. Yes, we have family and friends. But ultimately, we're walking this inner journey and outward expression of it solo. Mm -hmm. But after caring for Ethan and seeing how how we have approached death since then in our community with the center and, and offering similar similar but different care, you know, depending mm -hmm. on the person, their dying experience will be different, is different. I have come to realize that it can be an incredibly communal experience and mm -hmm. in support of the solo journey. So it's a both mm -hmm. and in my experience. Um, but you don't have to approach it all alone like is often, uh, that often happens. It's it's interesting, isn't it? Because the people who I was going to say haunt that's a very strong word, but the people I feel a grief for in in my experience are the the people who somehow have been unreachable. Um, you know, it might have pain that's un unreachable or carry a loneliness that that's unreachable and what the role of community is in supporting that that person. Um, I have a young man at the moment who doesn't want to know anyone and there's many things we can do to try and support him and his family, but his sense of, of where he's at is that he must do this alone, uh, as he has done in his life. Um, and just how you how you would approach that, Aditi, if if you're able to at all, you know, with 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 people who do seem to be lonely or or you know be beyond the reach of 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 a, a friendly arm, you know. Yeah, we've had a, um, a few people at the center we're caring for. You know, the beauty of the model that we're using is that the care is free to those who are dying. 
um, in our state. You know, every state has different legislation and, and regulatory requirements we, we can talk about. It might be different where you are. But in our state, because the care is free, anybody's welcome. And ultimately, mm -hmm. at some point, people who are dying will need some level of support. Yeah unless they just want to be alone and isolated and, and leave their body in their home alone, which is very rare that you, that you don't yeah. need some level of support. And at some point, if it's unsafe, we, you know, we have adult, adult protective services will be called in and, you know, th there are systems in place to ensure that people aren't um, doing harm to themselves by being alone and isolated. But we also want to meet people where they are. Yeah. And so one young woman, we, took in with somebody who was admitted to the hospital, 52 year old with endometrial cancer, ended up having rectovaginal fistulas mm. and sepsis from that. So she hadn't even thought about death when she got mm. admitted, but she was on the brink until the antibiotics kind of stabilized her and, and, and improved her um, status. But then she needed a place to go. She couldn't go home and live independently. So she came to us, but didn't think she was dying, didn't think she really needed us and our care. and lived with us for about a month and a half and almost we're, we're, we were looking to find another home for her because she stabilized and in that process she re maintained her individuality but we just touched in and met her where she was at and supported her in the way she wanted to be supported not with a whole embrace of community mm -hmm. until much later when she made a turn and actively started dying with us and she was held but we were able to keep she was it was wasn't as communal as we could have as it could have been, mm -hmm. but it was what she what she would tolerate and accept. So meeting people where they are, um, acknowledging that at some point dependence dependency is a thing, you know, that most people yeah. experience, and so it's okay to be patient with people. Yeah, that's and it, it, yeah, and Ethan was the antithesis of that, wasn't he? He was like, <laughs> bring it, <laughs> I'll say yes to everything, um, yeah. and such a beautiful man um and someone who lived consciously i have that impression he was going to die consciously but incredibly generous in in sharing his story um incredibly Absolutely. generous um yes such and, an inspiration to us yeah. all to this day when i watch the documentary and hear his voice and his perspective on life and his honesty and vulnerability about all his choices in life, you know, and even when he was on his deathbed, even though not all of this is captured in the film, he talked about that desire to stay around, yes. you know, to be celebrating. And he's been, he'd been yearning for this kind of community that he was met with in his living days, but with COVID yeah. it was, you know, he was, he was not as present. So yeah, he wanted to stick around and he lived 14 days after I told you the nurse practitioner said he was mm -hmm. too fragile to move. They thought he was going to die in route mm -hmm. and he lived another 14 days so i think it yeah he enjoyed it the yeah he did he um <laughs> and the universe conspired didn't it yes, for him to meet them. you and um that, that community um a, a lot of the story or where ethan or where people are turned away is fear isn't it um you were talking about um, healthcare and the the fear in in the hospice that something negative would be said and I've just been reflecting a lot about all of this and there is so much fear in society now uh, um, that it stops us doing or being who we really are and I think that was one of the things that Ethan was talking about he wanted to demystify death and take away some of the the fear involved in that. I just wondered if you had any sort of th thoughts on that, Aditi. And yeah, thank you. I think um, getting the average person to watch a film about death is not easy. No. And so I think the fact that this film is out there and shows a, a man's uh -huh. last breath in a very real, non dramatized, dramatized way, uh -huh. is a powerful tool for. Um, education and understanding the dying process but mm -hmm. who's who, how many people are really going to watch it is the question right mm -hmm. um, so I think exposure to death absolutely can support people in the in the dying the, around their fear of death and educating themselves about what it looks like and what options are you see a home funeral green burial mm -hmm. um, but what I feel to share is that two women now um, in their 50s with the cancer with children um, who are dying have watched the film 
and have for uh, prior to watching the film have been pretty resistant to the idea of dying and mm -hmm. not really talking about it. And two people I know of have after seeing the film within five to seven days have died. And I don't know if it's, and two people have to, one, the one of them, Jen, I specifically heard it, it alleviated her fear of the process yeah. and somehow allowed her to surrender into what was happening to her body. And the other one, I don't think, was so vocal about it. Oh, lights turned off. Sorry. <laughs> Hotel. Let me you turn this back on. You have to move around. <laughs> oh, yes. Sorry, Jane. No, no, no. That's okay. <laughs> you um, can see how dark it is here, really. Yeah. Let me just check on the lights. <laughs> it's, it's definitely nighttime in New York. Um, yes, it is. Uh, sorry, Jane. I'm going to turn them back no, on. No, no. That's good. Cool. All right. I'm with me. It proves it's li it proves it's life, Aditi. <laughs> That's what it does. That's right. Good. <laughs> and uh, yeah, embodied, empowered, and ecstatic. There we go. We're with the lights That's back right. on. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. It's beautiful. And, yeah, I'm. I'm just very interested with this interplay of 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 hope and fear. And I think you know, fear is the opposite of hope. And he talked about not not dying hopelessly. And other people might see him as hopeless. And I think it's a, a very hard message, as it, as you've said, with those two two uh, ladies that you talked about, to to get the message out there that death is a part of life; it is inevitable, and you can prepare for it. Um, and I I don't know that we're we're certain, certainly not in, in in Australia. I don't know that we're winning this. We're not winning society over with our messages about the value of death. Um, mm. I don't know if it's different in, in North America. There are pockets, you know, I think, mm -hmm. where the conversation is really being experienced by people who aren't already drawn to it and who mm -hmm. are, I mean, our, our nonprofit has, I think, 300 volunteers and 100 on a wait list. There's right. something uh, magnetizing people to this conversation in our region. And I, I'm hearing yeah. pockets in other places, but you're right. Um, it's so ingrained in our whole biomedical mm -hmm. model even. So until that shifts, I think it's going to be challenging. But like the Lancet, I, we, we, I'm sure, assuming you're mm. referencing the Lancet commission mm, yeah, paper. Yeah, the value of death, yeah. Yeah, value of death, bringing death back into life. We have much, sure. a lot of work to do. And mm. I think conversations like this, the work that you're doing in Australia, the work, if we can collaborate and expand, you know, our offerings, I think the better, but it may take generations to shift what's, what's happened in the last hundred years around death. Um, well, that's a shame. Know. I was hoping we'd fix it in the next 10 years. <laughs> we'll do our so, best. So I, was going to, I was going to put a bit of effort in, but um, I don't know now. Um, we have, we have to do our part. <laughs> we have to do our part. Um, I mean, I'm in, late in my career. I'm, I'm recognizing that you know that palliative care is is not the whole deal and that we do need the whole of society and a public health approach which is you know our, our audience here are pockets of people recognizing the shortfalls for for sometimes through awful situations of family members dying or whatever but recognizing um the, the shortfalls um it's wonderful that you have so many volunteers. Is it the is it the area that you live in, Aditi? Is that do you live in a, like a, a hippie commune? Is that is that where you live? Okay, good, good to know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, Asheville is a mountain town, very okay. deeply connected to nature. I think that's yeah. a big, uh, a common thread. There's not not everybody is think thinks the same or has the same mm. spiritual background or anything, but. They're all very people from different walks of life are being drawn to this. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you create a community or a place of service like this for the elders in our in our community, yeah. there's a there's a certain um, age group where they've retired, but they have a lot to yep. offer the world, yep. and they don't know where. And they're showing up. So like business people, sat, people who are savvy at different things are showing mm -hmm. up and serving in beautiful ways. Um, so I think there's we're tapping into that that elderhood piece and a place of mm -hmm. service and um, so I don't I think and we have a large elder population in Asheville so I wonder if that's part of it um, yeah, but connection to nature I think and respect and yeah. and deeply spiritual um, souls are drawn here a spiritual community do you think you can die well without a spiritual aspect to your end of life. 
Yeah, I've taken care of several agnostics, atheists, and I and I have seen peaceful transitions. And I think some of that is just being in the moment with mm-hmm. what's happening, not projecting into the future. So I think there's a, a contemplative approach that will serve even those that aren't spiritual, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, a, like a presence practice, mindfulness, basic coming back into the moment and being with what is, I think that can support people who aren't spiritual to have a peaceful mm-hmm. transition. Yes, because um, it, and just the society we live in, I, I don't know about North America, I think North America is more a more religious country than, than perhaps Australia. Um, and also a volunteer culture in North America that's very strong. Mm-hmm. I don't, yeah, and that, that's been my impression, uh, you know, having visited North America for on many, many occasions. Um, it seems that there's a, a service component in society. Um, is that is that correct or is that just my... Yeah, I, I think, again, in, in certain pockets, you know, we have yeah. a monthly group called Here We Grow for people around the country, and actually somebody from New Zealand's on that group, in that group, in Brazil. So it's, it's not just low, um, U.S., but... A woman who joins that call, she lives in a city in D.C., Washington, D.C., which is our um, capital. And she said, you know, in our city, volunteerism isn't possible because of the busyness of everybody. So I think that was an interesting perspective. Um, And and my curiosity is what can we do to meet the needs of a community if there isn't a strong volunteer support, you know, system? Mm -hmm. Is Are there ways we can support the grieving, you know, through programming or, you know, there's ways we can adapt in communities mm. where volunteerism isn't as prominent a part of the culture. But yeah, I think in general, you're right, service-based offerings are, are popular in the U.S. Um, the, I'm just trying to see if we've got any, um, there's a question here from Libby. Um Building on this, meeting all aspects of diversity, supporting men in this space. So do you find that is it skewed towards women as volunteers or as patients? Or what are we doing with our men folk? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, definitely more women, in my experience, are drawn to the death doula work. Mm. Um, and I think caregiving professions in general here. But definitely the populations of men we serve, and we have, we've served, I think, half and half, half men, half yeah, women. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so we're on our all for sure. Yeah, and uh, rich diversity in the people that are drawn to your community, the DT, is it very varied? Um, Asheville isn't is isn't as diverse as some of the other cities, and yeah. so we are, we draw upon the diversity we have, and people yeah from diverse backgrounds are drawn. But um, in general, it's pretty yeah middle class or above, and yeah there's there's privilege for sure. But um, yes, in a volunteer yeah. Base. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That yes, yeah, so, and um, that that sort of makes sense. Um, we have a question here from Harp. Um, are you able to, or do you separate your role as a palliative care doctor uh, from being a doula, death doula? Yeah, I do. Um, I'm still working part-time hospice doctoring. And um, I, at one point I, am, I thought about creating a private practice where I'm a death doula and hospice physician, but it, it is it, the lines get blurry specifically because death doula works that specifically are non-medical support for yeah. those who are dying, um, and I find it refreshing sometimes to take off my MD hat, and yeah, at times okay. frustrating because I would do something different. So I do yeah. keep it separate from for liability legal purposes, um, but there's no harm in combining, you know, mm. if that's of interest. I think, and really it's just a matter of enhancing your doctoring skills and having more time and space with a person bringing more mm-hmm. of yourself to the interaction um, as a death doula and doctor or nurse. Or, yeah, and what, what is, is there a big overlap, do you think, with the, being a death doula and a, and a hospice clinician? There are certain, there are quite a few retired nurses, not just necessarily okay. hospice nurses that are in our community and CNAs and LPNs that are drawn to what we're doing. Um, 
And actually what we're finding is there's a lot of unlearning that has to happen if you're okay. going to be a death doula because we have a certain way of doing things, thinking through things, approaching things, and we're asking people to have beginner's mind and really um, approach it from a more uh, familial place than a professional um, place. So we yes, become, yeah. as volunteers, we're extended family, we're extended community, we're caregivers, but not necessarily professionals offering care. So it is a shift. It's a shift. Um, mm -hmm. I look at, so there's there's uh, quite an increase in death doulas in, um, in this country. And I wonder if, that if that's because healthcare has not risen to to meet patients in end of life care, and I also think it's quite difficult to provide holistic care in a health environment sometimes um, in a bureaucratic process. Um, and I look at death doulas and feel slightly jealous. <laughs> Don't do that. That's the bit I want to do. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> you know that holistic care and yeah. um but it, it's it's the nature of of modern medicine as it is right now um and that we you know we're trying to meet healthcare in a in a system that's just incredibly medical for what is a human event not a, not a medical event mm -hmm. um there's a question here from Danny um what was the biggest gap the center catered to in the market for community in North America? Um, I think the biggest gap we're seeing is that hospice in our country provides excellent care, provides, you know, I'm sure it's similar to you all, MD, RN, CNA mm -hmm. support, chaplain social work support, but it doesn't provide that 24 seven caregiving support that is really essential for many people who don't have yeah. family or have kids scattered all over the globe or yeah. um, estranged from their family. So we're finding people without children or with young children that don't want to die at home. And we're seeing, mm -hmm. we've seen quite a few of those individuals, um, people we've taken out of nursing homes actually to die that ended up there because their spouse couldn't take care of them after okay. a stroke or dementia, progressive dementia, you know, worsening dementia. And so that's a an, an wonderful gift to be able to care for people, you know, after they've been in a nursing facility for a while and give them, mm -hmm. you know, that dying experience that is more communal and supported. Mm -hmm. um, my father and, and um, yeah, I haven't spoken of it much, but he died last week, actually. And um, we took him, for, he had a fall accidental fall picking flowers for us and hit his head had a traumatic brain injury and was in a coma after after surgical decompression of the bleed um, ended up staying in a coma I had multiple strokes probably anoxic brain injury and didn't wake up at all for two weeks thank you so much for your care um, and had made his wishes very known. So I, I have learned so much from him about death and dying, but also in practice, he prepared us for this time. Even though he was only 71, it came sooner and than we expected. And ultimately we extubated him and he was stable for that morning. So we all, the room was full of people in the ICU. And so we transported him to the center. My mom didn't want to take him home because she, didn't, she wanted neutral ground parking's easier at the center for all the love that he has. And we were able to give him a death that he wanted, which was with children around that the choir was practicing on site and they came in and sang for him hours before he died. And he died within four hours of reaching there. And the rainbow came out, the sunset nature is so prevalent. So such a part of the experience at the center. And it was just children were running around and it was just beautiful. And so that was a gap that, you know, just desire to be in an alternative place from a facility or hospital or private home. So yeah. that's one other example. Very thank surreal. You. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, Aditi. And I, I know this, we, we talked, I know this is very raw for you. Um, it's very generous of you to share. And I just think, imagine if that wasn't possible. Um, and 
people who do die in ICU. And um, I looked after a very young person recently who who was clearly dying, and this was in in the palliative care ward, and the family was so lost and how to care for this person. Um, it, and I, I just thought this wouldn't have happened 50 years ago. You know, you prepare, you wash the feet, you, you, you know, you massage the hands, you massage the hair, you have the music, you have the candles. We, we have to have electric candles now, Aditi, because you set the fire alarms off, you know. And... Um, That sacredness and the ceremony just just wasn't there, and it it was such a profound loss from, from my perspective. I don't know that the family thought that at all. Um, um, but I I wish everyone had what you and your family were able to provide for with your father, Mm -hmm. and that that's why we need the community. Yeah, and originally, you know, my dad was a very prominent um, movement disorder specialist and right. traveled the world, and he was very comfortable talking about death and mm -hmm. um, euthanasia even. Like he said, take me out, you know, so he kind Did of, he? you know, yeah, he always would say, take me out. I was like, I can't really do that in this country. <laughs> like, I've been in trouble, <laughs> but I'll keep you comfortable. I'll do my best, which we did. Um, why am I telling you this? Uh You were oh, yeah. So old, when we first extubated him, I thought we would just keep him in the hospital and let him go comfortably with medical professionals. And I would that that responsibility would be handed over. I felt comfort in that. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought. No, we're so just saying oh, yeah, how. So, yeah, so originally, yeah. yes. So originally I thought we would do that and he would take his last breath there. You know, you never know how long somebody will last when you take out the ventilator yeah. support. And so the, the idea was he would die there if, if that's what was going to happen um, immediately. And then we still would, would have brought him to the center for a home funeral. Okay. And I don't know what your laws are in Australia, but we have the right to transport a body from the hospital yeah, to same. a home setting, keep him in mm -hmm. honor, celebrate, do ritual, music, mm -hmm. have children doing art. We did all those things. Mm -hmm. And um, So either way, he would have ended up there. And um, there are ways to honor a person. If they can't have the death that they want in the ICU, then you can still honor them after with a vigil, vigil support for after yes, death. Yes, yeah. yeah. And not a lot of people understand that either. And um, No, no, it's true. And yeah. as we were talking the other day, I, um, my father and is, is very unwell, and so... I'm trying to care for for him in another country, and um, I'm sure he won't mind me saying all these things. But it's the support of his friends have been absolute paramount, um, but a very different situation of someone slipping, and there's not really watershed moments where you can make decisions and and okay, this is what we've got to do now, and I've. You know, it just that with aging and frailty and, you know, trying to hold that space, um, I think it it's very difficult for people and families to navigate that space now. Um, as we've said, you know, there's the expectations on medicine, but also um, the... It's just the, 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 the it's unfamiliar territory. Mm. And um, I think that's a huge motivation for compassionate communities is the recognition that there's, an, there's a, a gap here and there we can step into that. And, you know, I, I like the words of Michael Carney, who said, you know, the point of palliative medicine is to create the space for healing, which is, you know, what you were saying right right at the beginning, and, and that's what Ethan needed, you know, mm -hmm. healing to me, you know, to make whole. Um, I'm just very grateful for the lone wolves out there who are trying to set up stuff and, and um, you know, trying to create the space for healing um, because it's going to take all of us, isn't it? 
Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and we, like I said, all do our part, you know, um, yeah. that's, I love what you share about healing, you know, Ethan, his parents were estranged. And actually when I, when he was in the inpatient facility, I was told they can't be in the room together. They're toxic, you know? Ooh, yeah. And in the movie, there's a scene where his parents are in the same space and they're putting hands on top of yes. each other's hands. Yes. Yeah. And Ethan said something about what he was hoping for was the, his parents to enter a space of love mm -hmm. and whatever healing took place as a result of that, so be it. He didn't want to heal their relationship, but he wanted mm -hmm. the container of the love and safety to allow for healing to happen, which I think is such a beautiful sentiment, such a wise mm -hmm. man. You know? Yeah, he, he, he really, really, really was. And, and also his sentiment of letting go you know i think the, mm. the last words he said you know to build to that moment and let go because we're that's, so, that's his task now yeah is to let yeah, go exactly when we're so obsessed with controlling everything when the ultimate control is letting go yeah that's yeah surrender for sure yeah yeah um I think there was a few more questions I might have skipped over. But we're, we're getting towards the end. Um, so Yvonne has... Uh, oh, I'll just go back to Danny. Is VAD, Voluntary Assisted Dying, is that supported at the centre? Is that something... In, in our Well, in our state, medical aid in dying is what we call it. I'm assuming okay. that's the same as you all. Yep. You, have to, you have to be able to ingest the medication. Is that right? Okay. In, with... Uh, it's it's different states have different things. So in Queensland, mm -hmm. where we're sitting, I'm sitting at the moment. Um, you, there's you have you can have either option: ingestion or given by someone else as an injection. But different states. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's, we it's, don't have that. Is not legal here. No. Um, active euthanasia is not legal, um, but medical aid and dying is legal in eleven states, not in our state. Um, so okay. that in, involves ingestion and a prescription yep. being admitted, given. Um, we do support people who are fasting in order to hasten death when they have oh, a terminal okay. condition. Yeah, so okay. voluntarily stopping eating and drinking is what we call it, V said. Um, okay. We have supported people if hospice supports them because our model is we're a home, we're extended family, and hospice comes into the home just like they would any residence. Okay. And we like administer an meds. Yeah. Yep. yeah, we administer meds. We do holistic care, holistic treatments. Um and we support them if hospice, anybody who's choosing to hasten death, if the hospice program approves it, then we'll support them at this yeah, stage. Okay. All right. So it's really an, ex it's, it's kind of business as usual, but this is the person's home with extra supports because that's what yeah, they've exactly. chosen. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just aware that we're running out of time at ET and I know it's getting late for you. Um, mm -hmm. So there's just, um, I missed someone else's, um, Yvonne said, is there a methodology to deal with difficult, compassionate conversations around death and dying? Um, mm. I think um, methodology is a good word. Uh, I would say there's, uh, there's some skill involved. There's some practicing that is required. I think active listening and reflective listening are really wonderful tools yeah. to help people um, but active listening first, you know, I think you have to really hear what people are saying, what their fears and concerns are mm -hmm. in order to engage them and, and address what's really underneath their questions or, or reactions. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think being curious is probably one of the best assets you can have to be an empathic uh, professional, certainly in, in my, yeah. my line of work, you know, curiosity is so that, you know, tell me what you what you're feeling, what you're thinking. Yeah, uh, and tell me more, you know. If tell you, me more, well, absolutely. If, yeah, That's a good one to yeah, kind of yeah. guide, right. I was, I, I teach communication skills and I always teach oh, people a go. poet. A is being, you know, your attitude or aptitude, whichever. And, you know, curiosity is a good attitude to have. And P is perception. Check on people's perception. Where are they? What are they thinking? Oh, it's, it's orientation. You know, you've got to orientate yourself to them, and they then they have to orientate to to um, might be what they perceive as bad news. 
E is empathy always, and T is trust. You know, you need to walk, both walk away from that conversation trusting each other, and I think that's, um, if you get lost, tell me more is always a good place. You know, be, be curious. Yeah, we use palliative care support for my father and uh -huh. my papa, I call him. Yeah. And it was so supportive just to have a, a person with a compassionate, everything you said, Mm. He, he used um, mm. all those skills and it was just incredibly supportive and actually healing on many levels like eased it, the yeah. suffering of yeah of what was happening and the shock of what was happening and just really powerful so thank yeah, you for that April. yeah no absolutely and it, it would have been an enormous shock but it's validation isn't it just being heard mm -hmm. being seen when when you're the most vulnerable um mm -hmm. Um, yeah, even as a, even as professional as a professional going through that with my father was so surreal you know and I'm thinking how do I am so comfortable to, uh, with this reality and it's still like hard to fathom he's not here and so I can't imagine people who have no experience exposure to death and the grief that comes up in the pain and suffering that you know that some people endure because of the lack of exposure and conversations around it so I just have so much empathy for this this life reality, mm -hmm. this journey that we're all on in a different way than I ever have. So I'm sure is, yeah. I'm, I'll still integrate it all in the coming years, lifetime, the rest of my life. Actually, it's. do you think being having trained in palliative medicine helped? I mean, your father died very quickly, so. It did. It helped me um, logistically know what to do, what the options were, help it, make mm -hmm. it happen, you know, quote unquote, making it happen. You know what I mean? I Arranging do. things, expediting mm -hmm. things, like mm -hmm. all those skill sets where it came in. And, and ultimately when he was dying, I knew, yeah, it did help the, edu the mm -hmm. experience and knowledge, but, and that, those moments where I'm really in the moment, I'm not a doctor. I'm just his mm -hmm. beloved child. He's my beloved papa. You know, it just, yeah. all of that kind of goes to mush. If you've all, any of you have had personal experiences, you, yes. you know, it's just, yeah. Of, it's, yeah, it's that emotional um, body takes over. Your uh, flow state you were talking about. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And there's something, when you get to the bottom of that sadness, there's something quite freeing uh, about being so open. But mm. there's lots of layers to get through to be there. Mm. And yeah. Indeed. And I feel for you in your journey, you know, it's a friend of mine's mom just died last week after mm. he'd been with her for five years, oh. tending to her and she had dementia and he moved to Alaska mm. to be with her, uh, very far away from community. And so I just, yeah, there's no easy way to leave this world necessarily, you know? No, um, um, no. I, I do like the way, yeah, Ethan talked about leaving, leaving the body. And, I'm leaving my body, you know, that's a, yeah, that's that's a lovely a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My yeah. Uh, beloved mother-in-law also died in our home in 2019. And mm -hmm. she loved that. I said it in the TEDx talk, um, loved that reminder or belief that we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And that sort of speaks to the same thing that Ethan was saying. It does. Absolutely. And with that, Aditi, let's, end on your mother-in-law's <laughs> wonderful words um i i'm sorry we didn't get through all the questions everybody um but aditi what an absolute pleasure and and joy and I'm, i feel very grateful that we had uh, this time together and uh, particularly with everything that's happening in your life right now and uh, from Australia, we send a very very warm big virtual hug and um yeah. And you, all the best with, um, you know, your Centre for Conscious Living and Dying. It's, um, and may we have a counterpart at some point in this country. Yes. Uh, thank you, yes. everybody, for joining. Lovely to thank you, Julian. And um, see you when I see you, Aditi. Yes, lovely. Hopefully in person okay. one day. Yes, that <laughs> okay. would be beautiful. Yeah. Yes. See you all. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your support, everyone. I see the chat. Yeah. So precious.